This is FRM Part 2, Book 3, Operational Risk and Resiliency, Principles for the Sound Management of Operational Risk. Let's start by distinguishing between operational risk and business risk. We've talked a little bit about business risk before back in Part 1. I like to define business risk as the variability in value or returns due to business decisions made by the executive team, like a capital budgeting decision or merger and acquisition decision. Operational risk, on the other hand, I like to define as the variability in value or returns due to inefficient operating procedures. Examples of inefficient operating procedures uh, include things like hacking, things like internal fraud and external fraud, um, poor internal control policies, and this even extends to catastrophic events like weather events. Good example of operational issues can be seen in the first NBC bank back in 2017, and this bank had poor accounting controls, and we hear this pretty regularly not only inside of the financial institution industry, but outside of the financial institution industry. So what we're going to do in this slide deck is try to provide some principles to avoid those kinds of issues. And let me show you what I mean by looking at these learning objectives. So um, no calculates, no computes in, in this particular chapter. But notice that second one. We're going to summarize the fundamental principles of operational risk. That's probably the most important of the learning objectives, followed by the next one, explain guidelines for strong governance. But we're also going to describe some tools that can be used to identify and assess operational risk. And then initially, we'll look at some lines of defenses, and then we'll finish up with some technology risk and outsourcing risk slides. Now, of course, this committee, the Basel Committee, has been around for a long, long time. And um, this group of really, really smart men and women, they meet regularly, of course, but they meet uh, even more importantly after financial crises. And there was this was no exception back in the 20, uh, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And this idea of operational risk has really gained momentum since then, but it was it was. Uh, it, it was becoming more popular and more critical in the success of managing um, the operational risk of a bank than it had been, you know, say going back to the 1980s or maybe even the 1990s. So one of the interesting things, if you do a search for the definition of operational risk, you know, the first 15 or 20 of them come up with this Basel Committee definition. So I'm going to go ahead and read it to you, since lots of people have, uh, have copy and pasted it. The risk of loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes, people and systems, or from external events. So that sounds exactly what I suggested a little bit earlier. It includes legal risk, but excludes strategic and reputational risk. That strategy part goes back to business risk. Reputational risk, boy, that's that's a tough one to kind of uh, categorize, but the Basel Committee has clearly excluded it from operational risk. So let's attack that first uh, learning objective about the three lines of defense. So the first line of defense is business line management. What I'm going to ask you to do is go back to a discussion we had a long, long time ago, back in part one, where we looked at the different lines in terms of silos inside a financial institution. And each silo had its own objective and had its own team and had its own risk assessment. And what did we conclude? We concluded, oh my gosh, it's very important for each of those silos to operate as a standalone entity, but become part of a larger umbrella so that we can have some, an umbrella risk, uh, operational risk management strategy. And that's what we're doing here with this first line of defense. And let me show you an example. Here's, uh, here's JP Morgan Chase. So look at its six business lines. And if you consider maybe just some simple 
operational risks. Look under retail financial services. You know, retail banking, you know, I don't know. Do people even write checks anymore? I mean, I, I guess I write a couple of checks a year. What if the check doesn't clear for some reason? That sounds like an operational risk to me. Or consumer lending. You know, what if, uh, what if one of my financial analysts makes a loan to his or her brother-in-law and doesn't do the proper due diligence? So think about that retail financial services as its own unique set of operational risks. Compare that all the way over to the right-hand side. Let's just pick another silo over there. You know, the private wealth management under asset management. You know, what are some risks over there? You know, we're probably managing high net worth clients or or ultra high net worth clients. And so they're probably, you know, extremely sensitive to the timing and the execution of their trades. And maybe we forget to enter a trade when we wanted to. Maybe the computer has a glitch in it. Maybe it doesn't actually execute the trade. Maybe it does a buy when it should have been a sell. So you can see those operational risks are very different over in the asset management silo than they are in the retail financial services silo. So. Keep in mind that each one of these business lines has a unique set of exposures in terms of their operations. One, one little note, look at the bottom far right there, uh, Bear Stern Brokerage. There's a little reminder of that 2008 financial crisis. Uh, how about the second line of defense? This is what I was talking about with the umbrella, an independent corporate operational risk management function. All right, so this, this operates at the corporate level and it involves policy setting that provides assurances over those first line activities so that there's somebody up here who's ever acting as the umbrella. Maybe it's an individual, maybe it's a group of individuals and their responsibilities are shown in that, in that blue block. But it surely makes sense that they're part of the umbrella. You know, establishment, what it, what it sounds like a good word when we're trying to put together an umbrella operational risk management strategy. So we're going to measure the operating risks, we're going to report on them, we're going to have committees, and of course, we're going to keep the board of directors informed. And we'll talk a lot about the board of directors inside of this slide deck. And then the third line of defense is probably what you might suggest. Of course, we have all these silos and we have the umbrella, but then we need to have somebody come in and say, okay, what have you guys been telling us what you're doing? Let's go ahead and make sure that you've been actually doing that so we can have, uh, we can have an internal audit or we can have this review done by an external party. And so it's important to make sure that we compare what we expected to do and then evaluate those decisions to see what we actually did and make a comparison either inside or outside of the financial institution. Now the next part of the chapter is, uh, is a highly descriptive part of the chapter. I think this is the most important part and probably where many of the questions on the exam might show up. I'm calling this fundamental principles. And what I've done in the next three or four slides is I've bolded some important phrases in red. And I did that so that you can understand the importance of those red bolded phrases, but they're going to be really important as we get through those 11 fundamental principles. So look at that second block point. Look up at the first block point. This is important too. So this Basel committee requires banks to have a proactive operational risk management framework where, you know, this umbrella, you know, just thinking of a regular old umbrella when it's raining out, it consists of a bunch of different players that, uh, that play key roles in this operational risk management strategy. All right, so strong risk management culture. Let me tell you just a little personal story where, where I teach. Now, I think many of you guys know that I, I hold the CFA designation. The other finance professor at my school holds the CFA designation as well. And the two of us teach the overwhelming majority of the, of the finance courses at our school. And so we have designed many of our courses like investments and security analysis and even, you know, even, you know, like a 
like a stats class that we teach inside of our department fr from the perspective of the uh, chartered financial analyst program. And so this is a culture, you know, we have our students, we have many students who take the level one CFA exam before they graduate. I'm hoping now that some of them uh, are interested in taking part one of the FRM exam as we move forward. But my point is, there's a culture. So we have a culture where the students, they hear about CFA, they learn about CFA, and they understand how important pursuing that designation is to them as undergraduate students. And so financial institutions have to have that kind of a culture where strong risk management culture just doesn't simply mean that the board's leaders, uh, I'm sorry, the financial institution's leadership put out a memo once a month and saying, now remember, we should be having a strong risk management culture. This is where we go out to lunch and we talk about risk management issues. We go to conferences and we talk to our competitors and we talk to um, our board members and we talk to our clients and we talk to all these people all the time about risk management. Look at that second one, developed and fully integrated. So that's what I was talking about with the umbrella. And then the board of directors, establish, approve, and periodically review that operational risk management framework. And so, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen these where, where you work, you know, these flow charts. So you have, you know, you have a decision and a decision and you might have a little bubble and you might have some arrows, but there's always a loop back. There's always a loop that goes somewhere in the back that says someone right here needs to go back and make sure that we're doing what we say we're doing. You know, risk assessment is extremely important. Uh, here's one of my favorite ones, you know, the board, the board gets to determine risk appetite and risk tolerance. And so, I, you know, I always use my hands when I, I give examples. It's the board's responsibility to decide, do we want to assume this much risk or do we want to assume this much risk? And of course, it's the board's responsibility not to just simply think, okay, we're going to put out a memo saying we want this much risk and then forget about it. I mean, this needs to be in a clear manner, a clear manner that says something like, you know what, when the when a government regulator says that we need to provide some kind of a document to them on January 27th. Well, uh, by golly, we need to make sure it's in by January 27th. A well-defined governance structure. Now, this is really important, not only with the bank's risk appetite and risk tolerance, but there needs to be a well-defined governance structure so that those who are making decisions are making the decisions according to a well-developed process. Uh, look at that third one, incentives. Boy, do we want to have our employees evaluated and perhaps their compensation based on some kind of an, an incentive that has to do with number of clients approved or maybe number of clients rejected or following certain procedures, regardless of whether we make the loan or we don't make the loan. So those incentives, whether they are uh, directly related to compensation or not, must be in effect. And then if we're going to start uh, trading derivative contracts, or maybe we're going to put together our own mortgage backed security, any new line of business has to go through a pre-established approval process. And that makes perfect sense. Uh, monitoring operational risk is extremely important because if we, if we want to say that we're going to, if the board says you, we can take this much risk and then, you know, we're halfway through maybe this loan or this uh, securitization process or whatever it is, um, we need to monitor this. So, you know, if we're halfway there, then maybe we should be halfway there to that total risk. And then if these losses uh, um, or exposures become material, then it needs to flow upward. <laughs> it doesn't need to flow downward or stay within inside of this particular section of the silo. You know, this monitoring, well, it probably could flow up and down, but it should be flowing upwards. Um, boy, risk mitigation and risk transfer. Boy, I'm really, really keen on those two concepts. You know, how do we lessen risk? You know, we can do that by taking positions in derivative securities, or we can transfer risk by taking full positions in derivative securities, and we can counter contract and do all sorts of things so that we can manage these operating risks. 
Uh, how about this one? Major business disruption. And boy, in 2020, if we didn't learn anything, we surely learned a valuable lesson in terms of being able to take a step back and say, all right, what's the worst thing that can happen? How are we going to survive? You know, for, for example, every business, whether it's a financial institution or not, every business should have its owners or its board have a meeting that sounds something like this. OK, if we lose this gigantic client or these series of clients or our revenues are cut in half or or cut by two thirds, how are we going to survive? <laughs> and so, you know, you start listing all right, these are the expenses that we can cut. Some of them are obvious notions, some of them are wage related, and some of those might not be obvious. But this is a good strategy to major her business disruption management. And then, of course, we need to make sure that we write all this down and disclose it. Now, those three or four slides were almost in preparation for what I think is the most important section of the chapter. So we're going to look at 11 principles here and each slide looks the same. We're going to there's going to be a principle and then there's going to be some guidance. I'm not going to read all this to you, but you'll have these and the slide deck as a point of reference. But what I want to do is I want to work through this as if we were, you know, kind of a mid-sized bank. Now, what did we, we just we just saw the JP Morgan Chase, you know, don't think of that bank, although although we could. But remember, the top four banks, they all have, you know, one or two or three trillion dollars of assets. So let's not worry about these gigantic banks. Um, let's go ahead and worry about the middle of the road bank. And if you do a little bit of research, you'll see that the that the average total assets for financial institutions you know, is three or four billion dollars, but the but the median is like three or four hundred million dollars. So there's one of those. Boy, that surely doesn't look like a normal distribution, does it? So let's think of ourselves as a financial institution. And since I'm Jim, I'll just call it Jim's average bank. Think of us as having, you know, four hundred or six hundred billion dollars. No, did I say billion? Six hundred mil, six hundred or eight hundred million dollars in uh, in total assets. All right. So how are we going to establish and execute these 11 principles? All right. So we're a team. I'm Jim. Maybe I started the bank 100 years ago with my own capital. But since then, I've asked bondholders and shareholders to come on board. So maybe I'm traded in the over the counter market and I'm just Jim's average size bank. All right. Principle one, I'll go ahead and read parts of these. All right. Uh, spearheaded by the board of directors. Once again, the board of directors establishes the strategic plan for the financial institution and is responsible for us maintaining a strong risk management culture, just like we talked about just a, a few slides ago. Every individual understands the need to manage risk. So we have a code of conduct and we have training and this comes from the top. So think about this as a top down, a top down principle so that every individual in the bank is thinking about operational risk. Principle two, uh, fully integrated into the overall risk management processes of the bank. This is the this is the umbrella focus. So you have the senior leaders and the board of directors. Now, remember, our board consists of, you know, lots and lots of smart men and women who have experience either inside of the financial uh, institution industry or outside of the financial institution industry. But they probably had some kind of of a finance focus, whatever business they were in, so that they had to deal with banks from that side. So you got these two, you know, internal and external experts that are serving on the board. So what is that first block point there? Thorough understanding of both the nature and complexity of the risks inherent. So from my perspective, and, and by the way, I wrote uh, my dissertation, which was 1993, by the way, uh, was called Three Essays in Corporate Governance. So I did a lot of studies of board of directors, and this is what I found back then, and this is what's true even today, is that you know the board is only as good as the sum of the individuals. And then if you sum the individual skill set, you ought to get more than the individual uh, individual skill set. So that board operates you know, as that umbrella and that functioning line of operational risk management. 
So what does that first block point read? You know, thorough understanding, products, lines of business, processes, and systems. And then look at this, integra integrated into the bank's overall risk management plan. Principle three, what else does the board have to do? Review the operational risk management framework. All right, so we've got this big old flow chart. So you can just imagine a flow chart of decisions and processes and systems, right? And there are all sorts of arrows going every which direction. Well, it's the board's responsibility to say, you know what, let's go back and see if that arrow should be going here or maybe it should be going this way. And the only way that that can work is if we have strong internal controls. And that's characterized by individuals and teams of individuals who have clear uh, responsibilities. How about principle four? Here we go. Board approve risk appetite and risk tolerance statements. You know, this essentially goes back to my hand gestures, you know, this much or this much. So look at the guidance here. Ensure, ensure that we're considering all the risks when approving a bank's risk appetite. And that should also mean that we're now, remember, the board member is determining the strategic plan of the financial institution. So these operational risks have to fit in to that bank strategy. And of course, we need to regularly review them. And we, this is what we learned in 2020. You know, we have this virus that goes around and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the entire business model for our financial institution has been altered and all of our loan customers models have been altered as well. And so we need to review and review and review. Here we go, well-defined governance structure within the bank. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to, as a good financial institution, remember I'm Jim, I'm making decisions. Now maybe I'm, a, maybe I'm the, you know, the chief executive officer, and maybe I made all those decisions when I, when I started the bank, but I probably don't make those anymore. But what I want to make sure is that all of the talented individuals that are working down inside of each one of those business lines has a process under which they can communicate with each other, even if it's between and among those business lines. And communication, I mean, not only operational risks, but other kinds of risks too, because, and let me just do a comma, and let me take off my hat um, as discussing this particular chapter, and let me put my hat on from other chapters. You know, we've got to consider as good total risk managers, the correlations or the copulas between and among these different types of risk. That's why in that, what's that? One, two, three block, the third block point, I've got credit risk and market risk teams in there as well. Couple that with the nature, the size, and the complexity of the risk profile of all of the bank's activities. Now, inside of that framework, we've got to have specific policies and procedures that not only help us resolve disputes, but also help us make better and more defined and more well-defined and well-informed decisions. Because as I teach my students uh, in school, when I teach them about capital budgeting, capital budgeting, of course, is the process of planning for the investment in new product lines. You know, so with a company like Johnson & Johnson, it could be some kind of a new Q-tip. But with a financial institution, it's going to be maybe a new kind of a product new to our particular financial institution, or maybe just new in general, you know, could be some kind of new securitization or some kind of a new loan. But we need to make certain that we have this process that underlines being able to make better decisions. And so that's what this particular principle is trying to do, trying to accomplish support for the decision-making process. Now, principle six goes back to what we said in one of those first slides about the board of directors and the senior managers must understanding the risks inherent in the bank's business lines and processes. And there again, there are the incentives associated with these risks. So not only do the board have has to be experts, but so does senior management. That sounds like a that sounds like an obvious notion. So how, how do we how do we 
look for some kind of guidance on this. You know, we've talked about this audit, audit findings, internal and external lost data collection. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in just a few slides together with scenario and comparative analysis as well. Again, new lines of businesses. Uh, I just mentioned, you know, some mortgage securities or some other kind of securitization. Um, of course, it has some kind of an approval process. You know, if I'm Jim and I come to work one day, even if I'm the original owner and I'm the CEO, I don't really want to have the authority or the ability um, or the process to come in and say, you know what, I'm going to sit in my office and I'm going to craft a mortgage-backed security that we that we never did. I'm going to take mortgages that are over on that particular side of our town, and I've got you know 37 of them over there. I'm going to package them in a mortgage, and then this morning and then this afternoon I'm going to go over and sell them to an endowment fund over there. I mean, clearly I could probably do such a thing, but I don't really want to be able to do that kind of a thing, even though I might think I'm pretty smart, right? I'm Jim and I've done all this stuff for a hundred years. I want a process. So there's in bold up at the top, an approval process so that I put this together with my senior leadership team and I say, all right, this is what I think we ought to do. And then the leadership team then assesses this risk and establishes whether or not we should go forward and then the appropriate process under which we go forward. Of course, the board and the senior leaders have to provide some kind of a process for monitoring these operational risks and for not only uh, uh, quantifying losses, but quantifying material losses and quantifying material exposures. Remember, we had a whole bunch of uh, chapters on on those kinds of exposures. And so it's critical that the senior leadership team is aware of all those and is able to measure. This principle nine is also a good one. Strong internal controls, risk mitigation, and risk transfer strategies. We've talked at length in the past about risk transfer and risk mitigation. You know, how do you do this? Well, you, you, you use contracts, or maybe you can use specific contracts like, like a derivative contract to to completely transfer risk or, or at least to lower it. Now, when we bring in the specter of using derivative contracts, then we have other kinds of risk. You know, we spent some good time talking about third party risk. And so, you know, look at some of the guidance down there as it applies to Jim's average bank here. Let's suppose we're just starting trading derivative securities and maybe it's a credit default swap. You know, we need to make certain that we understand exactly what a credit default swap is and then how exactly to trade those and then what it means if uh, if those things finish um, in the money and we have to go and pay a thousand dollars, you know, per bond that that we insured effectively. So look at look at some of those, the implementation of technology, manning, managing the risk while we're outsourcing some of these activities. Um, and how are we doing this when there are stock market surges or plunges in oil prices or, or whatever it is that's going to take us you know, through that business cycle? Principle 10, guarantee survival and continuity. This is what I was talking about earlier, where look at some of those examples. Disruptions in technology, damaged facilities. Oh boy, there's that word. A pandemic illness that affects personnel and other businesses and clients and customers. And so think about this. Um, you know, back in the old days, a good financial analyst when making a small business loan would of course look at the financial statements, but then would you know look at the client base and then look at the sources of the operating process for that particular business. You know, nowadays we call it the supply chain. And so financial analysts now have to become supply chain experts, supply chain meaning on both sides. Uh, and what does that mean? And so as I was saying earlier, that there, there should be a plan that says, okay, if we have this major disruption, how, how are we going to survive? Now, of course, the board and the senior leadership team is probably not going to publish this report and say, OK, if we have a catastrophe, you 11 people over here are going to be let go or we're getting rid of this business line, which means you 43 people are going to be let go. 
but you've got to have this process involved and you have to have this thought of how do we survive. And then of course the last principle um, relates to the previous 10 principles and how do we keep track of all this stuff. So we're disclosing all of our efforts, we're disclosing all of our research, we're disclosing all of our research, and so we need to have somebody who can, A, write clearly. So good writing skills and writing communication. That's why lots of colleges emphasize writing skills. Some, some, do, it, some do it better than others. So notice what I have in the bold up there, disclosures that are clear enough. <laughs> Now, how about if we quickly go through some tools and processes? And I did mention uh, inside of those 11 principles, I was going to swing back and talk a little bit about some of those things that I kind of jumped over. So let's go ahead and read some of these in, in the orange. Remember, now this is like we have our lunch box. We have our toolbox. We're going to reach in. We need a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or do we need a hammer, whatever it is. So audit findings. Remember. Remember, we can put together an internal audit. We can have an internal audit team, or and we're probably going to have an internal audit team, but we're probably going to, at some point, maybe not every day or every week or every month, but at some point, ask somebody from the external environment. You know, I have a colleague. I have a colleague who really emphasizes, uh, he's an operations guy, who really emphasizes, you know, the need, the critical need for an external evaluation of the operating process. And so he's in favor, just like I am, and this is, of course, what the Basel Committee is suggesting, that you know, an, an external audit is probably extremely valuable. Now, this RSA, the Risk Self-Assessment, is the entire process of evaluating all of the operations. So you think about all those, all those operations and all those different business lines or silos, and what is the potential impact of these operational risks. You know, college students all over the place, my, mine included, when they write a paper, they always want to do a SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So this risk ass assessment is part of the threats. And I have my finance students, my investment students, uh, do this when they're forming their portfolios. How about internal and external loss data? So clearly, clearly we have Excel spreadsheets that can put together our a report on the losses that we have incurred based on different loans or different trades or different derivative contracts, right? So we have this gigantic Excel spreadsheet of um, our internal losses. What we want to do then is we want to use that data to see how it relates. There's this correlation and copula again. How does it relate to things like credit risk and maybe market risk? And maybe those losses are related. If there's a gigantic market event over here, like a like a plunge in oil prices, well, maybe that triggers large losses over here in our in our small business loan portfolio because maybe we're in the middle of Texas or Oklahoma and lots of our customers, you know, have, uh, have uh, oil wells as part of their assets. So clearly, clearly internally, we can collect this data and we can analyze it. But um, this is not a complete analysis of our losses because when there is a spike or a drop in oil prices, that may cause gains or losses on our financial statements inside of our spreadsheet. But if we look at external loss data, we look at that same event and we can see banks and financial institutions over here, and we can get have pretty easy access to you know, publicly available information of the losses that these financial institutions incurred because of that particular event, then we can kind of fill in the gaps and the blanks of our internal loss data. And that gives us much more spanning. We're better equipped, we're better informed so that we can prevent, uh, we can prevent those losses from occurring. Look at the very bottom, what I have in bold there. Whether it's risk management policies are effective, by combining and comparing external loss data with internal loss data. 
and then there are these things called key performance indicators, which you probably first learned about back in your undergraduate accounting class. These are typically just ratios like, you know, like a current ratio or a profit margin or return on assets. So these key performance indicators, which are based on, you know, accounting data and accounting information and financial statements. But uh, key risk indicators, they, these things, they can specify the main drivers of key risk. In other words, we look to it we try to find these at the most granular level possible so that we can avoid these catastrophic losses when they start. Um, you know, some key risk indicator examples include, um, well, what are we required to do? We're required by the IRS to put together some kind of a quarterly financial statement, and it's due, you know, the 15th of every three months. Well, a uh, key risk indicator would be uh, how many of our reports do we request an extension for? You know, we need some extra time. So if we need some extra time to assess a specific operational risk to put together this financial statement to report it to the federal government, well, then that might be an indication that some process is not efficient along the way. Uh, how about business process mapping? This identifies the key steps in the business process, right? So, you know, think about this, you know, what happens? We, let's just think about the mechanics of the way it used to be 100 years ago. We would have a client who would walk into the financial institution with some need, right? Either that, cl that client either, either has money and wants to invest it or needs money and wants to borrow it. And so, you know, the client comes in, so there's one arrow and then what is that business process? What we want to do is we want to get that client out the door with a smile on his or her face. We want them hopping and skipping to their car. Now, of course, a lot of this is mostly done electronically these days, but if you think about it in terms of individuals mechanically walking into the bank, uh, nervous, a little bit unsure, what am I going to get with this financial institution? And then they walk out with, uh, uh, with a smile on their face. Then that's that's the, a business process that was successful. All right, so key steps in that business process. How do we go from taking a, um, an insecure client to someone who's never going to do business with another bank ever again because our process was so efficient and so user friendly and so customer efficient that that client doesn't ever want to go anywhere else? Now, of course, there are a couple of really good benefits to having this mapping of the business process. And what it does is absolutely allows us to evaluate the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Allocate economic capital to various business units. Remember, we want that economic capital that's going to be able to handle these catastrophic losses. And so we want, we want those business lines to be to have access to that capital when it needs it. Uh, scenario analysis, this is a highly subjective process, but this is why we have computers and this is why we have Monte Carlo simulation. And this is why we have an Excel spreadsheet where you have a spreadsheet and what you do is you go in and you change one variable and then you run through the process again and see what the output looks like and the output changes by a little bit or it can change by a lot. And then you can evaluate those changes and in inputs to see which one, which of those changes are more critical than other. So look at what I have in there. Um, seeking the opinion of business line and risk managers about all the potential operational risk events. So think about changing a cell and then seeing what that output is. Comparative analysis is similar, but what we're doing is we're going to compare against maybe the different business lines inside of our financial institution, or, or we're going to compare different types of tools, like maybe beta or standard deviation, or we're going to try to compare what we do versus what other financial institutions do, comparative analysis. 
How about that learning objective uh, regarding features of an effective control environment? So I want you to think about a control environment. Think about that process. We got this. We have an individual coming into our bank. We want them to leave with a smile on their face. So there's a process by which they flow through our financial institution. And then you have all of us, right? We're all good financial risk managers. We're watching at every step to control, well, we don't want to control every step, but we want to make certain that the next step allows the client to put his or her foot right in front and right in front. We don't want them to have to do jumping jacks. We don't want them to have to do a karaoke. We don't want them to have to jump through uh, a rope or a hoop or whatever it is that kids do. We don't. We want them just to smoothly go through. So an effective control environment. So let me just read through these block points quickly. So uh, reliable financial reporting, that makes sense. Comply, that makes perfect sense. Operate its business efficiently, that's what I've been talking about here. And then achieve that strategic objective that was set by the board and then safeguarding of the assets, of course. So how about five key components? So I would memorize just these five. So there's the control environment, there is risk assessment, and I'm gonna go ahead and just remind you guys, those of you who've watched many, many of my videos, I say you gotta identify the risk, quantify the risk, and manage the risk. Well, there they are in bold again. Identify and assess and manage. Then control activities, information and communication, and then monitoring. Now the chapter ends with a couple of interesting things, um, a couple of things that I hadn't quite thought about in this whole process of operational risk management. And the first one here, vacation policy uh, that does not, uh, of not less than two consecutive weeks so that you don't have these key personnel away from the bank for a long time. And that, that makes perfect sense. And this, of course, leads back to staffing levels and processes for approval and pre-established risk, risk thresholds that are established by the board of directors, regular verification. Of course, all of these things make perfect sense. Now, that last, uh, that last learning objective is in regards to technology risk and outsourcing risk. So let's go ahead and talk about this here just, just briefly. Uh, notice what I have uh, uh, right underneath technology risk uses the same precepts as operational risk management and includes uh, some of the things that we've talked about. So I can get away with saying, all right, technology risk, you and I both know what technology risk means. So apply all of those principles, 11 principles that we applied to, you know, operational risk now to just technology risk. All right, so risk transfer strategies, oversight, policies and procedures, uh, tolerance, tolerance statements and thresholds and risk limit violations. Outsourcing risk um, is similar, but and we've learned a valuable lesson here in 2020. Countries are learning that, you know, when you rely on the economies of other countries and the, you have a pandemic, then, then that supply chain is going to be broken. You know, I'm always fascinated to hear that word, that term supply chain, but my gosh, you can't watch a news program talking about the pandemic and the international component of it without somebody using that term supply chain. I mean, that's, that's a good thing that we're all aware of the supply chain. And so outsourcing then um, has greater meaning when we consider things not just like, like hurricanes or wars or civil unrest, uh, but also something that affects countries indiscriminately like this pandemic did in 2020. And I think that takes us through the learning objectives. Once again, I think the two most important ones are the summarize the fundamental principles and then those guidelines.